Okay, uh, my YouTube is on. So let me turn on my video and let's get started. So um, we're at the stage here of um, the discussion of chapter seven, which in my opinion becomes a bit more abstract and consequently a bit more challenging to understand, to be perfectly honest. Um, I remember when I was a student, I in particular um, found um, the topics that we're about to cover very difficult to comprehend and it took me quite a while to um, get an appreciation for um, the topic. So I'm gonna to try to do my best to um, go as slowly as possible and try to explain everything as clearly as possible. And please feel free to stop me at any point in time if you don't understand what I'm talking about, all right? Okay, so we were talking about earlier um, about the structure of the atoms and we got to the stage where we talked about the discovery of the three particles that make up the atom and where they're located in the atom, all right? And um, the last thing we talk about is mass spectrometry, which basically is um, a record, well, a, a way of separating um, ions according to their um, mass to charge ratio. And um, so we're gonna get into a discussion of wave motion. Now you might be wondering why we're talking about wave motion. Well, you're gonna see later on that um, understanding the nature of the wave is very important in order for us to understand the nature of electromagnetic radiation, which includes the um, light that we can see. And understanding that, believe it or not, would lead to a better understanding of how the electrons are arranged in, a, in an atom. So we're gonna make these connections as we move along in this chapter, but we have to talk about the nature of a waveform. So I'm quite sure we all have had the experience, maybe as a child, of having a rope um, fixed to um, something um, immovable like a wall and you hold the other end and you move the rope up and down until you get a wave generated in the rope. And basically what is happening is that the energy that is um, produced as a result of the up and down movement is transmitted along the wave until it gets to the other end of the rope, all right? Now, of course, we all know that the rope particles are not moving with the wave. Um, basically, the, the rope particles are moving up and down. So if you choose one point represented by this black dot right here, initially that point will be moving up, the point of the rope will be moving up, and then um, when the maximum is going to reach a point where it coincides with the maximum of the wave, and then it starts going down, and then it starts going up and going down and so on, and therefore you generate a waveform, all right? Um, now, one way of characterizing a wave is by the height of the crest, which means the height, the peak height um, distance from the equilibrium or the or the um, non-moving part of the wave, or how should I put this? Um, the, when the wave is at point zero, so to speak. So um, we call that the amplitude of the wave, all right? And that's either the height of the crest or the depth of the trough, all right? Um, but there are some other features of the wave that we're going to talk about. But first, let's talk about one form of one waveform, which is known as electromagnetic waves, which originate from the movement of electric charges. And this is the waveform that's associated with all form of electromagnetic radiation. So um, one can represent the electromagnetic radiation as um, basically what you see here in this diagram. All right. So if you have a beam of light. Um, pointing in the direction of the arrow right here, then what you'll find is that there are two components to the electromagnetic wave. There's one component which is known as the electric field component, which is represented by the pink line right here. All right, so you see that waveform. That would be the electric field component. And then the other um, component would be the magnetic field component, component, which is represented by this line here, which is black here and then blue here and then black here, and then blue here, and so on. And you'll notice that in terms of um, where they intersect, um, according to where this black line is here, they intersect at the same position here, and here, and here, and so on, as, it con as the wave continues, all right? So basically, um, in the case of an electromagnetic radiation, it's basically of, um, produced as a result of fluctuations of both electric and magnetic fields, as you can see here, all right? now. 
Um, there's one other characteristic of a wave. We talked about the amplitude before, but there's another characteristic of a wave that will become important in this chapter, and that is the wavelength. And the wavelength is the distance between any two identical points in consecutive cycles, all right? Um, in some textbooks, they say that the wavelength is the distance between two successive peaks or two successive troughs, right? So in the case of this waveform here, the wavelength would be the distance from here to here. And the symbol that is used to represent wavelength is this Greek letter here. It looks like an upside down Y. It's actually a Greek letter called lambda. So lambda is a wavelength, which is a bit distance between two successive um, peaks or troughs or two identical points in consecutive cycles. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then we talked about, well, we didn't talk about this. The next um, characteristic of a wave is called a frequency, right? And the frequency, let me see if we have the definition here, is the number of cycles of that wave that passes through a point in a unit of time. And in the vast majority of cases, the unit of time is going to be seconds. In fact, I can't recall seeing the unit of time in this context being anything other than seconds, all right? So the frequency is the number of cycles that pass through a unit of, um, a, pass through a point in a unit of time. Now, the unit of frequency, let me write it here. Oops, sorry. Come down here first. The unit of frequency is um, seconds to the minus one, all right? And this is also called a Hertz unit, right? Hertz. All right, so whenever you see seconds to the minus one, it's the same thing as Hertz, right? And the symbol that is used for frequency, well, there are actually two symbols that are used. There's one symbol which looks like this. Um, this is um, a Greek letter nu. All right, um, so you see this in some textbooks for frequency. And then in other textbooks, you see basically an F which represents frequency. So you can use either nu or F to represent frequency, all right? So that's another characteristic of a wave. And then the third characteristic of a wave is known as the amplitude, which we talked about before. It is the maximum height, the distance from the line of no disturbance through the center of the wave peak, all right? So that's basically the amplitude of a wave, all right? So those are the three main characteristics of a wave that you need to be um, familiar with. Now, two of these characteristics are related to each other. Um, so basically, there's an equation which relates the speed of the wave to the frequency. I can't see your screen. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I keep forgetting, my bad. Um, let me share my screen. Hold on. Okay, can you see my screen now? Yes, yeah. sir. Okay, good. Uh, maybe I should back up a bit um, since I neglected to do that all important sharing of the screen. Let me um, go here. Okay, so I was mentioning the wave nature of light, um, the fact that um, any form of electromagnetic radiation has two components. You have the electric field component and you have the magnetic field component and they are at right angles, right? So in this diagram here, if you have a beam of light pointing in the direction of the arrow, then the electric field component will be represented by the pink line shown here. And the magnetic field component will be represented by the black and blue line or curve shown here, all right? And you'll see that um, at the line here of no displacement, you'll see that both waveforms intersect at those points here, 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 and continuing along the direction of travel of the wave. Okay, so um, I talked about the wavelength, which is the distance between two successive peaks, right? And then the frequency, which is what we were talking about just now, which is the number of cycles that, of a wave that passes through a point in a unit of time. Um, represented by the Greek letter nu, which looks like a U with a kind of tail, whoops. With a, uh, what is going on here? Okay, with a kind of, you know, for lack of a better word, tail right here. That's a Greek letter nu, which is used in most textbooks to represent frequency, or you can use F. In some textbooks, they use F to represent frequency. And the units of frequency 
is second to the minus one, which is the same thing as Hertz, right? Which is the symbol here, and that's Hertz. And we talked about the amplitude, which is the distance between the wave peak and the line of no disturbance, right? Okay, so I was just mentioning that there's a relationship between speed, frequency, and wavelength. So the speed of a wave is equal to the frequency times the wavelength. Let me use a black, I prefer the black color. So the wavelength would go here, all right? So that's the relationship between speed, frequency, and wavelength. And if you are to use the symbols, then the speed or velocity, which is represented by V, would be equal to the frequency, which is represented by nu, times the wavelength, which is represented by lambda. So um, as I said before, the frequency units would be seconds to the minus one, and the wavelength is typically in meters. So therefore, if those are the units for frequency and wavelength respectively, that means that the units for velocity is meters per second, all right? So that's a, way, that's a relationship between frequency wavelength and the speed of a wave. It turns out that in the case of electromagnetic radiation, um, the speed is constant in a vacuum. Um, so the speed of, let me write it here, uh, speed of a wave, speed of electromagnetic radiation is a constant. And that constant is equal to 3.00 times 10 to the eight meters per second, all right? And the symbol that is used to represent it is C, all right? So this is a constant, that doesn't change, right? The speed of electromagnetic, excuse me, electromagnetic radiation is always gonna be 3.00 times 10 to the eight meters per second. So in the case of electromagnetic radiation, C is equal to lambda times nu, all right? So because this is constant, that means that there's going to be an inverse relationship between the frequency and the wavelength. In other words, as the wavelength increases, the frequency decreases and vice versa, all right? So what you're, going to, what you're seeing here, this diagram that you see here on the screen is basically what we call the electromagnetic spectrum. And it's basically a list of all forms of radiation according to their increasing, in this case, going from left to right, increasing wavelength, all right? So um, as you can see here, um, the lowest wavelength um, in terms of radiation, EM radiation would be um, those that belong to the gamma ray category. And there's an overlap between gamma rays and X-rays in terms of the wavelength. And then the next in line is ultraviolet radiation. And then there's a narrow, bar narrow band here between the ultraviolet and infrared. That's a visible part of the spectrum here, right? That's a part of the spectrum that our eyes are actually sensitive to, and we can detect it as different colors of light, all right? So in we that, start, I'm sorry? In the bottom formula, C equals, what is that right there? Lambda, that's a wavelength. That, okay. Yeah, wavelength, lambda. That's a symbol that is used for wavelength. And this here is a frequency, new. Okay, I got the new, I just didn't know the, uh, the wavelength. Yeah, wavelength, yeah. Okay, so as I was saying before, um, there's a narrow band in the spectrum which contains the different colors of light that, that our eyes are sensitive to. So that is expanded right here, right? And it gives the corresponding wavelengths of the different colors of light. So at one end, at the lower wavelength end, you have um, violet, then indigo, then um, blue, then green, um, then yellow, then orange, and then red, right? And as you can see, the colors run into one another. So there's no clear line of demarcation between the different colors, all right? And um, I remember reading somewhere that only women can tell the difference between indigo and violet, which is at this end right here, which personally speaking, I have no problem believing because I cannot tell the difference between indigo and violet. So um, I'm, I tend to believe that that to be true, all right? Um, okay, so that's the visible range, right? Um, here, that narrow band that our eyes are sensitive to. And then after that, you have infrared, then microwave, and then a different form of radio um, mm -hmm. waves, um, namely FM radio, TV, AM radio, cellular phone frequencies. And then at the um, lower frequency or higher wavelength, um, and you have um, extra low frequency radiation, all right? So these are the different forms of radiation that exist in the total electromagnetic spectrum, all right? 
And as I said before, there's an inverse relationship between wavelength and frequencies. So therefore, as you go from, in this case, the way it's arranged here, as you go from left to right, you'll notice that the frequencies decreases, but at the same time, the wavelength increases, right? And that's because of the inverse relationship between the wavelength and the frequency. But you need to remember that when they multiply, you're gonna get the speed of the radiation, all right? Which is, as I said before, a constant, which is 3.00 times 10 to the eight meters per second, all right? Okay, um, any questions about the electromagnetic spectrum or the relationship between speed, speed frequency and wavelength? Any questions? Okay, so um, let me see what's next here. Um, just some general comments here about different forms of radiation. Um, there are some forms of radiation that we can actually feel on our skin or we can detect through other senses. Um, so the infrared, for example, if you're exposed to it long enough and depending on the intensity, you can feel it. Um, sunburn um, is basically what happens when your skin is exposed to too much ultraviolet radiation. Um, that is largely dependent on your complexion, really. Um, if you have a substance in your skin, which is known as melanin, then you're less likely to experience a sunburn. Um, there are some materials that vary in their ability to absorb or transmit at different um, forms of radiation based on their wavelengths or frequency. So for example, our bodies absorb visible light, but transmit most x-rays. And then window glass transmit uh, visible light, but absorbs ultraviolet radiation. Okay. Um, before we move on to, um, well, let me just describe what's happening here first. And then I want to look at a couple of examples based on the formula that we were just introduced to. So um, we can obtain um, the continuous spectrum from a white light source, right? So here's your white light source, a lamp, and the beam, the, it, the, the, the beam coming from um, the, the lamp um, goes through the slit, and then the beam emerging from the slit passes through a prism. Now this prism can be made up of glass or plastic. And what the prism does is that it, um, it causes what we call refraction. Refraction is basically the bending of light or other form of electromagnetic radiation as it passes from one medium to another. So in this case here, it's passing from air to the glass or plastic, and then it separates, right? So different colors of light have different levels or degrees of refraction. So therefore the separation starts here, and you'll notice that you have the red, green, orange, etc. And then it passes through the other end of the prism. So it goes from glass back to air. The separation occurs even further. And then it's transmitted to this um, photographic film. And you end up with your, um, your, your continuous spectrum, the visible part, at least. All right. So this is how you can get the visible spectrum being shown in an experiment. Um, so that's what happens when white light passes through the prism, all right? It forms what we call a continuous spectrum. And we call it a continuous spectrum because as I said before, as you go from one end to the other, there's no definite line of demarcation between the different colors. So you have the red running into the orange, running into the yellow, running into the green, running into the blue, running into the um, indigo and then violet, all right? So that's basically how that works out, all right? And this shows you the different wavelengths of the different colors, right? So um, in the case of the red line, um, the wavelength is approximately 650 nanometers. And you see the different numbers for the other um, colors in terms of the wavelength. And if you know what the wavelengths are, then you can calculate what the frequency is based on the same formula I talked about. So nu is equal to the speed of radiation divided by wavelength. So all you have to do is put these numbers into this equation to get the corresponding frequencies, all right? The wavelength, or I should say the speed of light um, or the speed of EM radiation is still gonna be the same, right? 3.00 times 10 to the eight um, meters per second. Okay, um, okay, so before we move on to the line spectrum, I want to do just one or two problems, some simple problems that um, demonstrate the use of this equation. So what I'm gonna do here is, um, okay, what shall I type in here? Um, um, Let me see if I can 
pick up on some problems here that we can do some practice questions on. Okay. Well, this one is showing us the answers. That's not too much fun. Um, let me do this. Okay. All right, let me show you. Okay, why is this not opening up? Okay, I don't know what's going on with that. Oh, hold on. Okay, I don't know what's going on here. All right, let me see if I can find a problem. I want a calculation problem. Okay, there's none there. Okay, let's see what this, ah, this shows us the answers. That's not too much fun. Let's see here. Dang, no problems here. I thought I'd be able to find one easy. This is crazy. Okay, let me um uh these all are showing answers. I don't want any answers. Okay, this is crazy. I'm sorry about this, folks. I thought this would be an easy. Okay, let me see. Okay, this one is a physics one, so that's dealing with things that we have not, we're not even going to look at. Oh no, not that one. Ah, all right, you know what? I'm going to go into my stash. Um, so let me go here, let me go here, General Chemistry One Lecture, and let me see here. Where shall I, problem sets, let me go here. Let me go here and let me go here. Okay, that's chapter six, chapter seven. Okay, um, so which one shall we look at? Number one, question one and um, we can look at A, B, and C. So let me, um, uh, let me um, do this first. Okay, let me see here. Copy and paste. Okay, copy and paste not working. All right, so let me try to work from this here. 
Um, in fact, let me do this. Okay, so that's the, those are the questions. Um, okay, so let me go back to. Okay, so the A part is asking for um, the frequency of the radiation whose wavelength is 460 nanometers, right? So remember the equation that we're using is um, C is equal to lambda times nu, right? So in the case of the A part, they're asking for nu, which is equal to C over lambda, all right? We already know what C is. C is equal to 3.00 times 10 to the eight meters per second. And lambda is the wavelength, which is given as 460 nanometers. But of course, what we have to do is convert nanometers to meters. And we know that um, one nanometer is equal to 10 to the minus nine meters. So that's the setup. So let's work it out. So it's three times 10 to the eight divided by 460 times 10 to the minus nine. And according to my calculation, this works out to be equal to six, how many sig figs? Two sig figs, so 6.5. So this is gonna be 6.5 times 10 to the 14. And the units here would be seconds to the minus one because the nanometers cancels, the meters cancels, so they end up with second to the minus one as a final unit. So that's basically how you do the A part. Now the B part is asking for, oh, we won't be able to do the B part yet. So let me scratch that out. Um, but we can do the C part. So the C part is asking for the wavelength, which in this case would be equal to C divided by nu. So, um, oh, wait a minute. Oh, we won't be able to do the C part either. Just remember, because we have not done this equation yet. In fact, let me save this question for later on as I move on to um, the other topics, all right? Um, okay, so we talked about the visible spectrum, um, or I should say the continuous spectrum, which um, you can obtain from a white light source. Now, I want you to consider what we have here on your screen. So what we have here is what we call a hydrogen lamp and it is made up of a tube which is evacuated with two electrodes, right, which are connected to an external circuit. And inside the tube, you have the hydrogen gas at very low pressure, right? So when you close the circuit, what happens is that the lamp lights up, right? And if the beam of that lamp is passed through a slit like we showed before, and then passed through a prism, and then whatever emerges from the other side is projected onto a screen, you're gonna end up with what is called a line spectrum. And I don't know if you can see clearly from your vantage point, but if you look at the line spectrum care, um, carefully, you'll see that there are lines of different colors, right? And between the lines, you have regions of dark spaces, all right? So that is what we call the line spectrum for, in this case, hydrogen, all right? And as you can see, the appearance here is far different from what we saw in the continuous spectrum because in this case, you only have lines with dark regions in between, all right? So for example, you have, um, this looks like a red or pink line here. And um, I think you have a blue line here. And then you have two lines here, which may be indigo or violet, depending on your ability to distinguish between the two, all right? And this is something that you see, not only with hydrogen in this sort of apparatus, but with different elements in the gaseous state under very low pressure in the same setup, all right? You'll end up with what is called a line spectrum. And what you'll find is that different elements will have their own unique line spectrum, all right? Um, so just to give you some examples of different elements, um, you have mercury, the line spectrum is shown here, lithium, cadmium, and strontium. These are all the different line spectra for these elements. So um, we can use a line spectrum um, to identify um, elements. And in fact, this is what is used to identify the elements that are present in the sun. Um, you have um, astronomists who um, have their own special instruments that can look from the, look at the light coming from the sun. 
And based on the spectrum patterns, they can identify that there are certain elements that exist in the sun as gases um, that would normally exist down here on Earth as solids, such as iron, right? We have iron present up there, but it exists as a gaseous element up there um, in the sun, all right? Okay, um, so that's basically the difference between line spectra and um, continuous spectra. Um, another term, by the way, for these, we call them atomic emission spectrum, all right? Um, okay, so let's get into what is now known as the quantum theory, and we'll be discussing what we call the black body radiation. So this scientist, I think he was from Germany, he proposed that when you have atoms vibrating in a heated solid, they can absorb or emit electromagnetic energy, but only in discrete amounts, right? And um, he determined that we can calculate the formula for these different amounts using this equation here. Um, so for the smallest amount of energy, it's called a quantum, and its energy, um, that value is given by this equation here, where the energy of the um, quantum is equal to H times nu, right? Nu is a frequency that we talked about before. Let me make a note of that here. So this is um, the frequency. And H is known as the Planck's constant, which has this value, 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 joules second. Okay, um, so according to Planck's um, quantum hypothesis, basically it states that the energy of an atom can be absorbed or emitted only as a quantum or as a whole multiples of a quantum if you're dealing with um, multiple, at multiple atoms, all right? So basically, if it's one atom, its energy can only be changed by this value right here, all right? Depending on the frequency of the radiation that is either emitted or absorbed by the atom. If it's more than one atom, then the energy will change by multiples of this value right here, all right? Okay. Um, move this aside here. Another thing I want to talk about here is the photoelectric effect. And um, basically, um, this comes about as a result of some consideration that Einstein was giving towards what Planck was talking about. Um, and in fact, um, the term for the packets of energy um, that was referred to according to the Planck hypothesis, they are now called photons, right? So photons are the packets of energy and you can calculate the energy of a photon using that formula that I mentioned before, which is E is equal to H, the Planck's constant times mu, all right? Um, oh, by the way, there's one thing I want to emphasize. Let me go back to the previous slide and I should have stressed this. Please note the units of Planck's constant. It is joules second, right? Not joules second to the minus one, not joules per second, but joules second. That's very important, all right? As you're gonna see when you do your calculations. Okay, um, so as I said before, the energy of a photon is equal to E times H nu. Now, this experiment here is a very interesting experiment, right? Um, which um, basically helps to describe some of the properties of radiation, especially in terms of the photon picture of radiation. Now, let me try to explain what's happening here. Um, inside this glass casing here, you have two electrodes. You have an anode, which is basically a pole, and then you have a cathode, which is said to be photoemissive. What that means basically is that if it's exposed to light or radiation of the correct frequency, it will emit electrons from it, all right? So basically, um, the anode is connected to the external circuit as well as a cathode. And as a part of the external circuit, you have an instrument here known as an ammeter, which is used to basically indicate that a current is flowing through the external circuit, all right? So when the photoemissive cathode is exposed to light of a particular frequency, what happens is that electrons are pulled away from the photoemissive um, cathode and it travels through space to the anode because the anode is positively charged, right? And therefore, as a result, not only do you have an electric current um, between the cathode and the anode here, you also have an electric current flowing through the external circuit, all right? Now, one thing that was noticed about this setup is that if the current is below a certain frequency, then no, I'm sorry, not if the current, if the radiation is below a certain frequency, then no current will flow, right? So the frequency of the light that is impinging on the cathode is below what is called a threshold frequency. There is no current that will flow. 
And it doesn't matter how bright the light is, if the frequency is below that threshold frequency, then basically no current will flow. Now, once the free threshold frequency is reached, then what will happen is that you'll see a sudden um, flow of electric current and that will be indicated in the emitter, which is a part of the external circuit, all right? So the important takeaway from this experiment here is that only photons with frequency above a threshold will cause a current flow and the flow of current is not dependent on the photon intensity, which basically talks about the number of photons present or correspondingly the um, intensity of the radiation the light, all right? So um, that gives some um, credence to the notion of the um, fact that um, radiation behave not only as, um, as a waveform, but also as a stream of particles known as photons. Now, we're gonna get into basically how all of this that we just discussed ties into the structure of the atom, especially with respect to the arrangement of the electrons in an atom. So this guy here, Niels Bohr, I think he was from Germany, he found that the electron energy was quantized. And what that means, whenever you see this term quantize, it basically means that the value, in this case energy, can have only specified um, values, right? And each specified energy value is called an energy level of the atom, all right? So basically what um, Bohr discovered was that um, electrons will have a certain amount of energy um, and it can have other values of energy, but nothing in between the separate values of energy. It's not continuous, but it's basically quantized. Okay, so uh, based on that idea, based on his discovery actually, he came up with an idea um, for the structure of an atom with respect to how the electrons are arranged. So this is called the Bohr model. In some textbooks, they call it planetary model. And the reason why they call it the planetary model, because according to this model, in the center of the atom, you have a nucleus, and then around the atom, the electrons will be traveling in what are known as orbits, just as how the different planets um, basically move in orbits around the sun, then according to the Bohr model, different electrons will move in orbits around the nucleus, all right? So the first orbit here is called the n equal one orbit. The second orbit here is called the n equal two, and then you have n equal three and so on to infinity, literally to infinity, right? So the n values here basically represent um, the different um, orbits according to the Bohr model. And he came up with an equation based on this model, which represents the energy of the different orbits. And that equation is given right here. En is equal to minus Rh divided by n squared. Now Rh is called the Rydberg constant. Let me write that here. The Rydberg constant, all right? So that's um, the Rydberg constant, and here's the value, 2.179 times 10 to the minus 18 joules, right? And of course, n is an integer going from one for the lowest orbit, and then two, three, so on, up to infinity, right? And please note, in this formula here, there's a negative charge, right? So what that tells you is that as you go from the lower orbit to the next, the energy of the orbit increases, right? And as stated here, the negative sign indicates that there are forces of attraction between the electrons in the orbit and in their respective orbits, I should say, and the nucleus, which is positively charged, all right? So based on this equation, energy, the energy of the orbit where it's located in infinity, right? So if n is equal to infinity, that means that the energy of that orbit would be zero. So what this is telling you is that if, if the electron is very, very far from the nucleus, then the energy of that electron with respect to the nucleus is going to be zero. Okay, so, um, so according to the Bohr model, this explains, as, well, let me say this, let me restart. According to the Bohr model, this explains the line spectra in the case of hydrogen, right? Because what we can do is calculate the energy required to promote an electron or for the electron to drop from one orbit to another um, below by using this formula right here. This formula here is derived from this formula that I showed you before, right? So remember I said that the energy of a particular orbit is equal to this right here. So if you're looking at a change in energy as you go from one orbit to the other, that is equal to H times the radiation necessary for the transition 
and that would be equal to minus RH times one over NF squared. Now N would be the final orbit, minus one over NI squared, where NI would be the initial orbit, all right? So we can use this formula to calculate the frequency of the radiation um, for the transition, all right? Um, so this is showing you what happens in the case of hydrogen and how the Bohr model explains um, the transitions and the different colors of light that we see in the line spectrum. So the Balmer series that you see here, well, let me explain what this is all about. So basically this line here represents the N equal one orbit, N equal two, N equal three, and so on. And you can have electrons um, going from a lower orbit to a higher orbit, which means that the electron would have to absorb energy. Or if the electron drops from a higher orbit to a lower orbit, which means that the electron will lose energy. So in the case of the lines that we can see, um, we can explain that using the Bohr model. For example, the red line here is due to an electron falling from the n equal three to the n equal two um, orbit. So in the hydrogen lamp that we saw earlier, when you close the circuit, you're imparting energy to um, the molecule or the hydrogen atom, and the electron will basically jump from the lowest energy level to the highest higher energy levels. And then almost immediately, those electrons will fall to the lower energy levels. And in the case of the red line, that results from the electron falling from n equal three to n equal two. In the case of the blue line, that results from the energy, the electron falling from energy level or orbit four to orbit two. And in the case of the purple or indigo line, um, that requires the energy transition from n equal five to n equal two orbits. Um, and therefore a red, or I should say a purple line um, is produced, all right? So that explains um, what happens in the case of hydrogen. So the Bohr model works very well when it comes to explaining the line spectra of the hydrogen um, atom. Um, okay, let me talk about some definitions here. So when you have electrons in the lowest possible energy levels, um, those electrons are said to be in the ground state. And if those electrons are promoted to any other energy level higher than the ground state, those states are called excited states, right? So you can have electrons promoted from low energy levels to higher energy, energy levels by electric discharge, heat, lasers, in the form of photons. Now electric discharge is what we saw in the case of the hydrogen lamp, but you can also have electrons being promoted using other methods. And then immediately what you'll find is that electrons in an excited state will drop back to the ground state and we call that relaxation. When the electrons drop back to the, um, from the excited state to the ground state, then that's where you see radiation is produced, all right? Um, so that is demonstrated in this diagram right here. So you can have an electron going from n equal one to n equal five, right? So that's a promotion, right? From a lower energy level or orbit to a higher orbit. And um, so that's excitation taking place. And then you can have electrons falling from higher orbits to lower orbits, such as n equal four to n equal two, or n equal four to n equal three, or n equal three to n equal two. Um, in all these cases, that's where relaxation takes place and energy will be released, all right? Um, now, one important point I want to make here is that um, as stated here, the length of an arrow in this diagram is inversely proportional to the photon wavelength. And the reason why that is so is because the length of the arrow is proportional to the change in energy. Now the change in energy is going to be equal to H nu for the radiation that is involved, right? And we know from before that nu, let me do it up here, is equal to C over lambda. So if you plug in C over lambda where nu is here, you're going to get H C over lambda, right? So if you look at the relationship between delta E and lambda, you'll see that it's an inverse relationship. In other words, um, the greater the transition of, um, the greater the energy of the transition for the um, electron, the smaller would be the wavelength of the radiation involved, all right? So there's an inverse relationship between the energy transition or the energy of the radiation that is either produced or absorbed and the wavelength of the radiation that is either produced or absorbed. Okay, um, let me see, what else shall we talk about here? Okay, so basically this is just emphasizing what I just said. Shorter wavelength um, will result in higher energies and vice versa, all right? Okay, now before we get to de Broglie's equation, 
I want to go back to the examples that we had before, because now we have enough information to do the other questions. So let me go back to this right here. So let me erase here what I just crossed out here. Okay, so now we can do the B part here. Um, the energy of a photon or frequency, 4.2, 5.20 times 10 to the 11. Let me erase this here, whoops. Let me erase this here. Okay, so um, in the case of the B part, um, the question is asking for the energy. As we learned just now, energy is equal to H times nu. The energy of a photon is equal to the Planck's constant times the frequency, right? So the Planck's constant is 6.63 times 10 to the, if I remember correctly, it's minus 34. Sorry, let me remind myself of what the Planck's constant is. Uh, right, minus 34. So let me go back to this. Uh, 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34, minus 34 joules second times the frequency. And the frequency here is 5.20 times 10 to the 11 seconds to the minus one. And let me do this calculation here. 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34 times 5.20 times 10 to the 11. So according to my calculation, this works out to be equal to 3.36. So 3.45, 3.45 times 10 to the minus 22 joules. Of course, this is going to cancel with that. So the remaining unit will be joules. So that's basically how that is done. All right. And then, um, excuse me, in the case of C, The question is asking for the wavelength of the radiation. It gives the energy of the photons. So remember this equation here? Well, that will be used in a different form because nu would be the same as C over lambda. So delta E would be equal to H C over lambda, right? Now the question is asking for the wavelength. So therefore we can rearrange this to get wavelength is equal to delta E over H C. So delta E is three, 0.70 times 10 to the minus 17 joules divided by H, which is 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34 times C, which is 3.00 times 10 to the eight meters per second. And when you work that out, you're gonna get, let me see here, 3.7, zero times 10 to the minus 17 divided by 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34 times three times 10 to the eight. Okay. So according to my calculations, let me do this again. I have a funny feeling I did something wrong. 3.7 times 10 to the minus 17 divided by 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34 times three times 10 to the eight. Okay, I was right. Okay, so round off to three sig figs. So according to my calculations, this works out to be equal to 1.86 times 10 to the eight. And the units for this would be lambda, would be meters, I'm sorry, because um, this is Jews second, by the way. The joules will cancel out, the seconds will cancel out here and here. So your final answer would be meters. So that's the answer I got for lambda for the C part, all right? Okay, any questions about any of these examples? Any questions? Any questions? All right, um, give me a minute, I'll be right back. <sighs>
Okay, folks, I am back. All right, so, um, um, okay, I think I already asked if you have any questions about this. So what I'm gonna do is move along to a discussion of the De Broglie equation. And um, I don't know if there are any French speakers among us, but if you speak French or if your first language is French, I, I beg your forgiveness because I know I just massacred his name. I'm quite sure that the, the Broglie part, um, the way I pronounce it is incorrect. So please forgive me. Um, so Louis de Broglie, um, he speculated that, okay, based on what was known before concerning the nature of radiation, that it can exist or its properties can be explained as, um, either waveform properties or stream of particles properties, um, then it's possible for particles will display wave-like properties when they're moving, right? So he proposed this equation right here, where if you have an object that is moving and its mass is m and um, the speed is v, then the wavelength associated with that particle that is moving is given by this equation, lambda is equal to h over mv, all right? So um, that's basically an equation that he came up with. And it turns out that his theoretical work was very important um, in the development of the most powerful microscope known, which is the electron microscope. Um, basically, in the case of electron microscope, um, instead of, instead of um, depending on optics or light, it depends on a stream of electrons um, to basically bring out sharper images. And that's because electrons um, basically have a higher mass compared to a typical photon and therefore the wavelength um, would be shorter. And as a result, um, the microscope that is developed based on this theory is more powerful, all right? So this is yet another example of how theoretical work um, that has been put together or done by one researcher can be used by others to develop um, you know, technologies that um, make our lives better and lead to um, other discoveries and so on. Okay, so um, let's talk about something now which is really abstract. What time is it? 10.25. Okay, so we have enough time to complete this particular topic. So this is, let me warn you, this topic is really abstract. Um, and one of the reasons why it's um, kind of difficult to appreciate is because to be perfectly honest, um, and even the, you know, even somebody who is an experienced researcher in this particular area of wave mechanics or quantum mechanics will tell you um, is that this area of science is not fully understood. There's a lot still left to be learned concerning quantum mechanics, all right? So um, as a result, a lot of people, especially when they're meeting this for the first time, um, they do have difficulty um, understanding um, what it's all about. So as I said before, I'm going to try to be as slow and deliberate as possible in terms of explaining um, this particular topic. And again, I ask if you have any questions, feel free to stop me if there's anything that you don't understand about what I'm about to get into. Okay, so wave mechanics or quantum mechanics is basically an area that has been developed because of the discovery of the wave-like properties of particles such as electrons, right? And this guy here, Schrodinger, he developed an equation to describe the behavior of an electron in the hydrogen atom. Now, I will not even show you what that equation looks like, all right? Um, at your level, it's not important, but I can tell you it's a frightening equation um, when you first look at it. Um, I remember when I was in college, as a chemistry major, we had to actually learn about this equation and how to use it um, and so on. And have, I've used it, of course, to pass my exams and so on, and I've not looked back since because it was not my favorite topic, all right? Um, anyway, so he developed an equation um, to describe the behavior of particles such as electrons. And that equation um, demanded a solution, which is called a wave function, right? And that wave function basically represents the energy state of the atom. So how do we inter interpret the wave function, which is a solution to the equation that Schrodinger, Schrodinger um, developed? Well, basically the wave function 
um, represents um, in part the property of probability of an electron being found in a small volume of space around the atom. So to calculate that probability, we have to square the wave function. So the square of the wave function gives the probability of finding an electron in a small volume of space around the atom, all right? And therefore, as a result, it leads to the common and more modern interpretation of, the, um, of how the electrons exist in an atom. Um, it, in fact, it contradicts the Bohr model because the Bohr model suggests that the electrons exist in um, orbits, right? And I should have said this before, but there were several problems with that Bohr model, not the least of which is that the Bohr model only works for hydrogen or one electron structure structures, it doesn't work for helium, um, and, and it doesn't work for the other elements, all right? So that's the main reason why Schrodinger did his work and came up with this idea that electrons do not exist in orbit, orbits, but they exist in what are known as orbitals, which are basically electron density around the nucleus of an atom. Um, so the orbital is basically given by the square of the wave function. Now, um, let me talk about also the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, which also contradicts the Bohr model. According to Werner Heisenberg, he says that we cannot simultaneously know exactly where an electron or any small particle is and exactly where it is moving, right? So, um, you know, that basically um, contradicts um, the Bohr model, right? And the reason why Heisenberg came to this conclusion is that the act of measuring the particle actually interferes with the particle itself, right? So basically, if you determine where the particle is at a particular instant, then at that instant, the particle is not there because whatever act you take in order to detect that particle will basically displace that particle and the particle will be where, will be somewhere else. So just to illustrate what we're talking about here, let's say you have a special microscope that allows you to detect an electron, but the only way you can detect an electron is if a photon bounces off the electron and move towards the microscope. The problem is that when the photon hits the electron, then what happens is that the electron will be displaced, right? Now, according to the microscope, the electron, the image of the electron will be here, but the electron is actually will be somewhere else because what you're actually seeing is the image produced by the photon bouncing off the electron from the initial um, standpoint or the initial position, all right? So that's basically what um, the um, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle is saying. And therefore, as a result, the Bohr model um, failed because the Bohr model basically suggests that you can be certain that the electron will be within um, some orbit, all right? Um, okay, so that leads us now for a discussion of what we call the quantum numbers. Um, okay, hold on, let me stop here. Um, I want to do one or two examples based on the Bohr model. So let me get out of this here. And let me try to find questions based on the Bohr model. Okay, so um, let me see here, okay. Uh, I want some calculations. Oh. Um, before we get to that, there's something I should mention, which is very important. And in order for me to do that, let me open up this here. Okay, now remember I said that the formula for calculating the energy changes, delta E, that would be equal to minus RH, one over NF squared minus one over NI squared. Okay, so that's the equation I showed you earlier. Now remember, RH is a constant, which is equal to 2.18 times 10 to the minus 18 joules, if I remember correctly. Let me check and make sure on that. I don't want to lead you guys astray. RH is 2.18, yes, 10 to the minus 18, right, okay. And NF squared or NF or an NI would be the final and initial energy levels or orbits according to the Bohr model, all right? Now, um, we know also that delta E um, is equal to H nu, which is equal to H C lambda, all right? So now we have a relationship where H C 
over lambda is equal to minus RH times one over NF squared minus one over NI squared, all right? Now, we can rearrange this to divide both sides by HC. So if we divide both sides by HC, we're gonna get one over lambda is equal to minus RH times H times C times one over N squared F minus one over N squared I, all right? Now what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna plug in the values for these constants. These are all constants, RH, H and C. So minus RH, which is 2.18 times 10 to the minus 18 joules, divided by H, which is 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34 joules second times C, which is 3.00 times 10 to the eight meters per second. And that will be multiplied by one over N F squared minus one over N I squared, all right? So let me work out what we have here, 2.18 um, times 10 to the minus one eight divided by 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34 multiply by three times 10 to the eight. And that gives you a value of minus 1.10 times 10 to the seven. And the units here, because the joules will cancel out here and here, the seconds will cancel out here and here. So this will give you M to the minus one as your final units times one over n squared f minus one over n squared i, right? And that would be equal to one over lambda. Now, why am I going through all this? Why am I showing you how to get to this equation here? Well, the reason why is because in some textbooks, they express, they give this relationship here, right? And that is called um, the, Rydberg equation, I think. But more importantly, this is called the Rydberg constant in this case, Rydberg constant. But in this form here, this equation or this constant here is also called the Rydberg constant, right? So, um, Rydberg constant, constant. So, Basically, I'm saying that in some textbooks, you're gonna see this equation where Rydberg constant is 2.18 times 10 to the minus 18 joules. And then in other textbooks, you're gonna see this equation where this would be the Rydberg constant, which is 1.10 times 10 to the seven meters to the minus one, all right? So, um, and believe me, I've, cons I've consulted a wide variety of textbooks and also some sources online. And I see the Rydberg constant being expressed as one or the other, right? So I'm just saying that so that that is something that you should look out for. Now, I will say this. If you want to find the energy change for a particular transition in a Bohr atom, then I would use this equation right here. But if you want to find the wavelength for an energy change, then I would use this equation right here, all right? So which equation you're gonna use is based on or dependent on what you're trying to find. If you want to find delta E, then you will use this equation. If you want to find lambda, then you would use that equation, all right? So, with that said, I want to look for some examples so that you can see how we use um, these equations. Okay, let me see what this gives here. Oh, saw that already. Um, let me see this one here. Okay, let me see, let me see, let me see. I want to see, you know what? Let me do, another, let me do a different search. Let me do Rydberg. Rydberg equation worksheet, okay. So let me, um, let me try this here. I wish I could write on this. Uh, let me see, let me see. 
Let me see, let me see, let me see. If I can find, okay, that does not give me the type of question I'm looking for. So let me look at this one here. Okay, let's see. Um, all right, let's look at the series of questions here. And let me insert a new slide. And um, Oh my God, what is that? Okay, you know what? Why am I wasting time with that? Let me go into my stash of questions. Okay, let me see here. Let me see, let me see. Uh, okay. Okay, let's look at this question right here. The final transition from n equal to of hydrogen if the wavelength of light corresponding to this transition is 486. Now, the problem with this question is that they're not telling us if the light is absorbed or emitted, because that's very important. So I can't do that question, final trend. Okay, I can't do that question. That, that question does not give enough information. Oh gosh, where can I find an example? All right, you know what? I'm gonna stop here for, the, for today. What I'm gonna do is search for an example and then the next class we'll be working on that example, all right? Okay, so in the five minutes that we have left, are there any questions? Any questions? Any questions? No questions? Okay, um, that's basically it for today. So um, enjoy the rest of your day and I'll see you guys on Thursday, all right? All right, take care.